Hello, listeners, and welcome to an emergency cognitive dissidence podcast. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Apologies in advance for the low sound quality and for the poor video quality. I'm in somewhere in rural Mississippi, about two hours north of Jackson, spending the weekend with my father-in-law and my family and was not expecting the events of this weekend to happen. Otherwise, I would have brought a mic with me. Um, Before I say or begin or do anything, I want to have a political disclaimer at the beginning of this podcast. If you are coming here or if you found me and you are looking for justification of what Hamas has done or justification for what Israel is going to do in retaliation, if you are looking for the moral high ground, if you're looking for vindication um, or anything like that, turn off the podcast and go find another one. This is not what's going to happen on this podcast. We are going to try and be as sober and objective as we possibly can be about what's happened over the past couple of days and what's going to happen going forward. Um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been going on for over a century. Uh, for over a century, uh, Muslims and Jews and Palestinians and Israelis have been killing each other, have been terrorizing each other, have been waging war on each other. Um, I don't know how you quantify or qualify where the high ground is or if such a thing is even possible. And certainly it's not something productive I can do here on the podcast as well. So if you're looking for that kind of content, if you're looking to feel right or wrong, sorry, wrong place, go somewhere else. Uh, Second recording here, Sunday, October 8th, at just a little past noon central time. So it's evening now in Israel. Um, Sunday evening, we're going to get this out in the next couple of hours. Um, Tomorrow, we're publishing an episode with Marco. Cousin Marco is back on the podcast. And the theme of that podcast was the geopolitical settling of scores. We were talking about the Russia-Ukraine war, about Azerbaijan taking back Nagorno-Karabakh, about Serbia and Kosovo, and some of these other lingering conflicts that because the United States is weakening as the global hegemon, because we're going towards a multipolar world, you expect to see more of these types of conflicts because there isn't one power that is making all the rules and there isn't one country that is enforcing them. So in that sense, um, this latest flare up of Israeli-Palestinian violence, and it's it's maybe the worst Israeli-Palestinian violence since 48, since 1948. Um, I think I'm willing to go out on that limb and say that, um, is part of that larger tapestry of a multipolar world and of conflicts in these smaller regions um, basically taking place because there isn't that global hegemon to enforce them. Um, Let's talk very briefly about what has happened thus far. Um, Hamas fighters didn't just fire rockets into Israel this time, and really in a a big change of behavior from Hamas, they launched rockets and then used that to invade Israel with their fighters, guerrilla fighters mostly. I've seen a lot of comparisons out there from the intelligence failure in 1973 to now. Um, Yes, I think you can say it was an intelligence failure, but those are apples and oranges. By 1973, the Yom Kippur War, that was Israel's arch nemesis at the time, Egypt, mobilizing its military and then going after Israel with a full-on you know, military invasion, risking shipping in the Suez Canal, everything like that. Um, that's not what Hamas did. They didn't mobilize an army on Israel's border and moved in. It was guerrilla fighters that attacked, to be fair, soft targets, targets that weren't particularly secure. You'd expect them to be much more secure. And yes, maybe Israel didn't have good information about when the attack was coming and what people were planning but it wasn't so obvious Um, i don't if you were an intelligence official like yes you'll be held accountable but very very hard unless you have direct human to the people who are planning this sort of thing to know exact date exact time all those other sorts of things now i think you can definitely lay some blame at the fact that israel's internal divisiveness uh politically and we've talked about that here for a long time we're going to talk about it here in the next couple of minutes shortly Um, Maybe that had Israel focusing on different things. Maybe it had them focusing on the West Bank. Maybe it had them focused on their own internal divisions rather on securing all their borders. I think all of that is fair game. But I think to compare this to 1973, really a bad metaphor. I would also caution people about comparing this to 9-11 in the United States. Um, First of all, relatively, it's going to be a much bigger event just in terms of casualties relative to the Israeli population. But second of all, I'm not sure anything is gained in the metaphor. Um, That was a really a shock for the United States to be attacked on its own soil uh, by terrorists in that regard. This is not a shock for Israel. It might be a shock for this youngest generation, which hasn't really endured a threat quite like this. Um, But Israel is is in a completely different context and has a completely different relationship with violence and things like that. So rather than comparing it to 73 or comparing it to 9-11, I think we need to do the hard work of not comparing it to anything right now. We need to understand it on its own terms and say that really what it is, it's the October 7th Hamas attack against Israel, where it's probably going to turn into, I mean, maybe we call it the first real Israeli-Palestinian war, because I don't think this is going to be 
just a short military operation here from Israel. And I think we need some new terminologies and I think we need to sort of take this head on. Um, so what, sorry, that was a little bit of an aside. So Hamas fighters overrun um, Israeli towns, Israeli kibbutzim, take over police stations and things like that. I think at one point there were 22 different locations where Hamas fighters were holed up. 36 hours later, there are still apparently gun battles going on between Israel Defense Forces and Hamas fighters inside of Israel right now. So Israel still has not secured the border at all. Um, distressingly from Israel's point of view, um, earlier today on Sunday, Hezbollah fired off a couple rockets um, at Israel as well, sort of in solidarity with what Hamas was doing. The Israeli response, uh, fairly slow at the beginning, uh, but Benjamin Netanyahu came out and declared war on Hamas and said that they were going to go in with a major military operation to decimate Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad and all of their abilities to wage war. I think the more important thing here is that what was a very divided country, and you can go back and listen to some of the podcasts I've done about Israel's divided geopolitics and how one of the reasons there has not been a Jewish polity in this land many times in history is because usually, whether it's the Israelites or the Israelis, usually the Jews start fighting with each other and the polity f- falls apart and either the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Persians or the Romans or somebody else sweeps in and conquers them and you don't have an independent Jewish polity in the region, usually the seeds of, 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 a, of a Jewish state's demise are in itself in that internal squabbling. Um, that squabbling is gone. So the opposition parties have already come out and said there is no opposition. There is no coalition and things like that. Whether they form an emergency coalition government or not, um, I think you have Israel united around Benjamin Netanyahu and united around the idea of uh, you know, reinstalling deterrence and reinstalling Israeli security both in the south and north and on all separate borders. A real sea change here and Hamas has basically created um, unity inside of Israel for the first time. I don't I don't know how many decades it's been since we've had this kind of uni- unity in Israel, but that is what has happened going forward. Um, the death toll, pretty astonishing. Um, usually when it comes to Israeli-Palestinian conflicts in the last couple of decades, you know, is, uh, uh, Palestinians fire off a couple of rockets. There are some Israeli casualties. Israel usually retaliates five or tenfold in terms of force and kills more Palestinians um, than Israelis got killed in the initial assault. Uh, that's not true. Actually, that's flipped right now. So the death toll here, it's about, like I said, noon, October 8th. The death toll in Israel is over 700 people are dead. Over 2,200 people are injured and 100 people have been, at least over 100 have been kidnapped and brought to the Gaza Strip. Um, in Israel's air and artillery retaliations, it looks like between two and 300 Palestinians dead so far. I am sure the numbers on both sides will continue to climb. Uh, but really stark for someone who's been watching this conflict for a long time to see the Israeli numbers much higher than the Palestinian numbers. That is not something that you see um, particularly often there. I'll also say one of the reasons it is hard to be objective and unemotional about this conflict right now, I actually tried to record this podcast last night and I went back and listened to it this morning before we posted and I was just too emotional um, because a lot of this was caught on tape. There is uh, you know, really harrowing videos of Israeli women, children, elderly people getting kidnapped, being brought back into the Gaza Strip, um, you know, bodies of soldiers being mutilated and things like that. Um, it's one of the more disturbing things I've ever seen in my career. And, you know, I watch disturbing videos sort of as a, as a, you know, for a living. Like if you're doing geopolitical analysis, you're looking at wars and insurgencies and terrible things. And this is just because of the level of detail that's been captured and some of the things that are happening. Uh, it really goes right up to the top uh, in terms of of the the pain of it all, the anguish. It, it probably is the bloodiest day in Israel's modern history since it was founded, which is really, really saying something. Um, Let's move on next. So that's what's happened here so far. Um, Before we get to what's going to happen next, I want to talk a little bit about the motives behind Hamas here. And this in some ways is the most confusing thing for me because I don't really get it. Um, All Hamas has done, as I've said, is united Israel around one government. And I think that they have sowed the seeds for their own destruction. Uh, Israel has never really had reason or justification to go back into Gaza after withdrawing in the early 2000s under the Sharon government, uh, it has reason now. And I don't think that Israel is going to stop. We'll, we'll uh, deal with that assumption maybe in a little bit more depth in a little bit. But I think Israel is going to respond in a big way. So what made Hamas want to do this? Um, I really only have three potential reasons. The first is just exhaustion and desperation. I mean, Gaza has been an open air prison for a long time. The occupation is tough. It is grinding on people. Uh, when bad things happen to people, it doesn't make them better people. Bad things have been happening to 
the Palestinians for generations at the hands of the Israelis, at the hands of Palestinian leaders, at the hands of other states who use the Palestinians as pawns in the region. Uh, again, not wanting to get into who has the moral high ground or anything like that. The objective fact is, that, in fact, is the Palestinians get screwed by everyone at every turn and have for generations. So these are people who are exhausted and desperate and desperate people who have been backed into a corner do desperate and horrible things. Um, in some ways, you know, the, the Israeli state is founded in the shadow of the trauma of World War II and the Holocaust. If you want to understand the Israeli mentality, and again, one of the reasons why the 9-11 comparison really doesn't work, you have to think about how that trauma transcends generations as well. So it could be that. could also be a little more strategic. It could be that Hamas is looking to foment an uprising in the West Bank, that they want to take over from Abbas, uh, Mahmoud Abbas in the West Bank, that they want to get Hezbollah into the party, that it really is the sort of Al-Qaeda approach to where, okay, we're going to make this attack. It's going to incur a massive counter-reaction. And then the Muslims around the region will rise up and attack Israel. And by creating the sort of avalanche, we will eventually win because we have the numbers and we are the martyrs who started the process. I think that is certainly on the table, especially considering the jihadist elements of, of Hamas ideology. The third and much more coldly uh, geopolitical strategic take would be there was some reporting on Friday that there was progress in a deal for Saudi Arabia to finally recognize Israel formally diplomatically. Um, and that what Hamas has done is that by doing this, they are going to create an Israeli response that is so aggressive that there's no way that Saudi Arabia is going to be able to make that deal. Um, I'm very, very skeptical about that vein of thinking. It might be what they thought, but it's a really strange way to think about it, and I think a mistaken way to think about it. First of all, I'm not even convinced that normalization was real. Um, the Saudis have been asking for civilian nuclear technology for the U.S. to bless Saudi Arabia, build, building their own civilian nuclear technology. That, of course, is a whole can of worms right there. They, want to, they reportedly wanted a mutual defense treaty. I'm sure they wanted all sorts of other economic considerations and things like that. And it's not clear to me why the United States would give all that when the United States doesn't import oil from Saudi Arabia anymore. Yes, Saudi Arabia does have some impact on the price of oil, but they've been trying to jack up oil prices all year. Uh, so this idea that Saudi Arabia is going to boost production in January, that's going to bring Brent crude prices down. Brent crude prices, you know, closing the weekend were around 82 a barrel, and they really haven't jumped even despite all these rumors about war. So I had my questions about whether Saudi Arabia was ever really going to normalize relations with Israel without getting something big in return. And I was arguing with one of the analysts we have on staff about what that could be. I'm not, I'm not really sure, but I think Saudi Arabia is going to need more. My point here, though, is that if Saudi Arabia wants to normalize relations with Israel, this will not stand in the way. All those Sa Saudi press statements about, oh, Israel bears responsibility for this because of the crimes of occupation, things like that. I think that's all bargaining. That's all negotiation. The price of normalization just went up. But if Mohammed bin Salman and the Saudi regime wants to normalize relations with Israel, if that is what they think is in Saudi interest, they are going to do it no matter what happens with the Palestinians. Full stop. And if you think that's callous, or if you just look back at history, that's what happens to the Palestinians every single time they get used like this, whether it's the Egyptians or the Jordanians or the Syrians, they have been left out to dry over and over and over. And if Saudi Arabia gets what it wants, and it doesn't, the Palestinians don't have their own free state or their own security, the Saudis will take what they want. That, that is my impression there. So if Hamas was doing this to scuttle that deal, I think they made a big miscalculation. Um, if, you know, Hamas has already said that Iran is helping them, is behind Hamas's invasion. I'm sure some of that is true, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure what Iran gets from the timing of this right now. In particular, maybe they think that by scuttling the deal, that's also good because they don't want Saudi close with the United States. And you also recently had the Iranian-Saudi rapprochement that was brokered by the Chinese. Iran has also been producing more oil lately, and the higher oil prices are, the better things are for Iran. So maybe you can push things that way. Um, but again, that would be Iran using Hamas as a pawn, and pawns usually get sacrificed. Pawns are not usually standing at the end of the chess game. So if that's what Iran is thinking, there are other shoes to drop here and other grand strategic maneuvers. And we're going to have some podcast guests um, on the podcast in the coming weeks who are much better at Iranian foreign policy than I am. So I can ask them those questions, and try and figure out if Iran had some motive here in the grand scheme of scuttling. So that's my best for the motives, but I'll tell you right now, if, uh, if I was a geopolitical analyst advising Hamas, I would have said, you're crazy. This is really dumb. And you basically just signed your own death warrants right now because Israel has everything in need now to come after you. And Israel, for the first time in decades, is united against you. You should be very, very afraid. And all these other scenarios that you're playing for probably not going to happen. Um, so that's sort of where we get for motive. Uh, what is going to happen next? Two assumptions. Uh, before I say what's going to happen next, I want to point out two assumptions in what I'm saying that could be wrong. 
The first assumption is that I am thinking that the Israel Defense Forces, number one, are going to go after Hamas and destroy Hamas in the Gaza Strip, probably a land invasion. None of this just air power and artillery and bombing targets. I mean, a full-on land invasion. Um, And I am assuming that the Israel Defense Forces are up to the task, that this is not going to be like the Lebanese Civil War, that this is not going to be like the failed um, war with Hezbollah earlier um, in in the 2010s. Um, that Israel has the capability to go in and to decimate Hamas the way that is threatening and to do it quickly and decisively. If this becomes a long protracted conflict that is beamed out on social media for periods of months or years, that would put more pressure on the Saudi government. Uh, It would mean that, you know, parts of the Arab world could rise up against Israel and things like that. So I'm assuming that the IDF is up to the task here and that Israel's political unity uh, will make sure that IDF capabilities are used in the correct way. That is an assumption. That could be wrong. If I'm wrong about this take, that's one of the main analytical assumptions I would have to interrogate. The second analytical assumption that I'm making here is that the Saudis are pragmatic, that this is not about a moral or an ideological cause, that they, like other Arab states and like the Saudis in the past, are using the Palestinian issue for diplomatic reasons, for political reasons, as part of a larger negotiation with Israel and the United States, but that ultimately all Saudi Arabia cares about is its interests. Now, everything that Mohammed bin Salman has done since he became the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, everything Saudi Arabia has done since the Khashoggi affair and murder, making up with Iran, increasing ties with China while negotiating with the United States, that looks like a coldly rational geopolitical player to me, not one that cares about ideology and morality, even if you know opinion polls suggest that Saudis are against Israel. It's an authoritarian state. It's literally a monarchy. Mohammed bin Salman is the crown prince. So I'm assuming that Saudi is thinking about this at that pragmatic level and that that there is something they want from israel and that's what's going to determine it i'm that i'm as part of that i am assuming that if again if saudi arabia wants normalization this is not what's going to hold it up they're going to use this in negotiations but it's not the thing that's going to hold it up i'm wrong about that if there is an ideological bent to the saudi government or if the saudi body politic forces ideological or moral considerations onto mohammed bin salman then i could be wrong and set out some of what i'm going to say is going to what happens next? Um, I pretty much just said it. I don't see that Hezbollah is going to get into this fight. I know they fired off some rockets. I'd be shocked if they went at it for real. Israel's already called up massive amounts of uh, reserves and is mobilizing its military forces and is sending military forces to the north uh, preemptively to make sure that Hezbollah does not test them. And I think Hezbollah knows that if they picked now, they would also be in the crosshairs. I don't think that in the West Bank you'll see uprisings, and I don't think that the other Arab states are going to come uh, to Hamas's aid right now, even if they're going to make statements intimating that. Statements are one thing. Actual fighting and weapons and support um, is quite another. Um, so I think probably what happens next is, like I said, that full-scale Israeli invasion and incursion into the Gaza Strip. I think that means tons of civilian casualties. I think that Hamas's leadership will be completely decimated. The idea of Hamas will not die. I'm sure a new crop of leaders will pop up, will be even more radicalized by the violence that is coming. But this generation of Hamas leadership, I don't think many of them have long to live. Um, I think Israel is going to treat this not as a security operation or anything like that, but as as a war. And I think they are committed to, they already killed 700 people, they kidnapped 100. Uh, one of the things that has stopped Israel from full-scale, full-scale wars and committing its infantry to full-scale wars is that Israel has gotten a little bit squeamish about casualties. They've already taken the casualties. And they have hundreds of people who have been kidnapped and who they have video on social media of some of the kidnappings and how gruesome and horrible it is. I mean, I think you're looking at a population that is not going to be squeamish at all and that is going to go house to house and block to block until they feel that security is reinstalled. And it's going to be terrible for the people of Gaza. It's going to be terrible for the young Israeli soldiers, both their casualty rates and the things that are going to happen to them psychologically for a long time for the awful fights that are coming. Uh, that's what I think is, is going to happen next. Now, again, if some of my assumptions are wrong, I could see some other scenarios, but not a regional conflagration. I think this is an Israeli-Palestinian war. I might start calling it the first Israeli-Palestinian war uh, rather than some of these other small operations. Um, some, wild card, car, some wild cards here to think about. I don't know how to think about what Turkey is going to do here. Uh, Turkey and, the, and Israel had a falling out over the Mavi Marmara incident in the early 2010s. You might remember that. They've patched up relations in recent years. Turkey has given support, uh, political, rhetorical, even financial, economic, to Hamas at various times. Uh, They've, you know, called for calm and lowering of tensions and breaking the escalatory cycle already. Uh, But I'm not sure that Turkey gains much by this. And Turkey has also been 
has you know Russia to deal with, has been supporting Azerbaijan, has been moving ever so closely to the United States, has been more skeptical of Russia, and Russia and Iran are aligned in sort of the grand scheme of things here. So I'm not sure where Turkey sits. Turkey is a wild card. And if it wants to play a big role here, I'm sure it could. But I think Turkey, I, I, I'm not quite sure where Turkey goes here. It's something to watch. The second is Iran. And I already talked a little bit about Iran going forward. I don't think Iran has the capability to do much more than it already has. I don't know whether this is Iran decided to support Hamas, whether it's a radical faction of the IRGC thought this was a good idea. We've seen dissension within the Iranian political regime itself and talked here about how the aging supreme leader opens up some of these inconsistencies in Iranian foreign policy. Like I said, we'll have some guests on in the coming weeks to talk about Iran a little bit further. But obviously, that is another wild card in the region and one to think about in general. Uh, Geopolitical implications across the board. If my scenario is right, probably not a ton, to be honest. Um, I was arguing with one of our analysts on staff today. He thinks that the Saudi-Israel deal is dead. It might have already been dead anyway. I, I don't think that this is going to be the thing that is going to kill it. But I don't see how this generally changes the balance of power much, except in that it makes Israel strong and united again. Israel has not been strong and united for decades. And it looked to me like Israel, the social fabric of Israel was beginning to come apart at the seams. Uh, Hamas just glued it back together. And that may be the biggest geopolitical impact of this going forward. You're going to see a strong, scared, frightened, desperate Israel for the first time in a long time. And that's going to make waves in the region in general. But for the great powers, I don't think the great powers want to get involved in this. And I think they'll be sitting on the sidelines seeing where this goes from here. Last but not least, investment considerations for this. Yes, it is cold and callous to think about that at this particular moment. But this is the Cognitive Investments Podcast. And one of the things I enjoy about investing is that it it has a way of disciplining you because you're thinking about market performance, not about the moral moral issues here and things like that. We have no active positions. We're going to talk about this in our research call tomorrow. But some of the things that I already proposed to Rob and that we're going to be thinking about over the next coming days, um, Israeli equities have already nosedived considerably as a result of the reporting. Uh, The shekel has also lost a lot of strength against the dollar, roughly 5 and 6% for both of those over the past couple of days. I'm not sure I get that. Wars are generally good for economies. And like I said, I think this should galvanize a pretty weak domestic political situation in Israel. So if I was looking to sort of catch Israel on the down low or or sort of catch, you know, uh, mispriced opportunities in Israel, this might be a position to do that. You might also, you might not want total exposure to Israel in general because mobilization does impact a country as small as Israel, but maybe Israeli defense stocks is something to think about. I think that defense stock theme in general Uh, From a global perspective, due to all of the violence we're seeing around the world, that is something that we've already been thinking about at CI and something we're going to be thinking about longer in general. Um, I also think it's interesting to look at oil right now. Oil hasn't done that much already. Um, I would probably argue short at this point in terms of oil prices because they haven't really bounced on the news. And I think the consensus view that this is a repeat of 73 um, for several reasons is just complete and totally wrong. And that said, As you probably remember, because Rob and I talked about it the last couple of weeks, fundamentals for oil, I actually thought were pointing upwards. So as uh, Marco tweeted earlier, if you follow Marco on Twitter, you know, he was tweeting that really Israeli-Palestinian flare-ups have not had much impact on the price of oil. This might just be market fundamentals and there is no oil. There is no oil trade in relation to that. I'm sensitive to that too. But if there is a trade there, I'm wondering if it's short and that's something we're going to be exploring a little bit longer. Uh, Two other countries or themes to look at. Number one is Egypt. And again, this is not necessarily in relation to the invasion, uh, but we've had this sham election to reinstall Sisi as president. There have been rumors about another Egyptian devaluation for for its currency being near. Gaza was once uh, under Egyptian control before the Israelis took it from them and some of the wars in the 60s and 70s. Um, Could you see streams of migrants that are entering Egypt? Could you see Hamas flaring out from that direction or fighters going after Egypt if they don't think Egypt is playing Um, a productive role in the overall conflict. For all those reasons, um, Egypt might be an interesting one on the downside risk scenario, but it was already flashing red. This just sort of might tip it over. Again, it has nothing to do itself with the conflict, although this might, you know, generate an opportunity there. And then the last one that I would just think about is um, thinking about being long Saudi Arabia in different ways. Um, Because no matter how you sort of how you play it, Saudi Arabia is the country that is doing the best right now in the region geopolitically. Um, you know, with oil, even at oil at 80 a barrel, that's good for the Saudis. They still control the oil market. They have the United States coming to them, negotiating with them. They have China coming to them and negotiating with them. They seem to also have pragmatic relations with Russia. They're funding Turkey. They're funding Pakistan and Egypt. I mean, 
Saudi Arabia has its geopolitical deficiencies, but looks like it's in a really, 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 really in the cap or the heat of the Middle East right now, and it's not threatened directly by just about anything. Um, so if you're thinking about a time to the, you know, I've been pessimistic in the long term about Saudi Arabia, Vision 2030, and all the things that Mohammed bin Salman has been talking about. Uh, but I cannot help but look at the board and with that cold hearted geopolitical perspective, just say, things really do look good for Saudi Arabia right now. If you're thinking about, you know, of how this affects regional stability and things like that. Um, I just want to close by, and I've, I've already said this, so I'm, I'm repeating myself, um, but I'll just say, um, this shit hits different when you're a parent. Um, you know, I've, I've, as some of you have listened to the podcast for a long time now, you know, that I'm a father of a beautiful 14 month old. I'm even wearing my, uh, my girl dad TV shirt here as I record this podcast. Um, and when you see the videos, when you read the stories about, you know, parents protecting their children with their bodies and shielding them, you know, and dying to protect their children, all the things that we're sort of watching in the videos and the horror that's unfolding, uh, it's really hard to stay objective. And the only way I know to stay objective is to admit about how horrible it is, how terrible it makes you feel, and then compartmentalize that, put that in a nice bento box, sort of on the bookshelf, and go deal with it later on my own personal time. But I just want to acknowledge um, just how terrible this conflict has been for so many generations, um, how terrible the situation is for the Palestinians, their lack of agency and independence and security and hope in any kind of future. And it's been that way for generations, how horrible it is for young Israelis to grow up with no hope that this situation and conflict is ever going to be resolved, that their children have to serve in the military and be forced to do all sorts of terrible things that I've never had to experience or most people have never had to experience, let alone you know, when I'm going to college, they're going to the military and manning checkpoints and things like that. I mean, it's just horrible. And then also just this actual event, how horrible um, it's going to be, not for soldiers here, but for civilians, for you know, civilians at Kibbutzim who were at a rave party, apparently, was one of the things that were attacked, the nature party, uh, you know, elderly people at a bus stop. I mean, just when you have war and things like this, people who suffer the most are the civilians who they didn't think about this ideologically. They didn't wake up that day thinking that was going to happen. So I just want to acknowledge the human cost here and the human pain. I feel it um, for, for as objective as this podcast is, I, I feel it very deeply. And if you are thinking, feeling human as well, um, I think we just have to acknowledge that pain and suffering and thoughts and love with the people um, who are going to be experiencing those things. Probably not worth a lot, but um, yeah, that's about all I got. I wish it was... Uh, I wish I could be a little more upbeat and optimistic, but I have to close on that somber note. So we will have some more podcast guests on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict coming up in the coming weeks. I'm lining up Israeli security official Kamran is already lined up to come back. I'm going to try and get my old professor from college who teaches a history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, class at Cornell on the podcast. Uh, we're going to try and get you some content here over the coming weeks. And obviously, we'll update if any of my scenarios are wrong or if we do get that regional conflagration. Um, but that's the quick take from me. Uh, you've got Marco tomorrow and, uh, you'll hear from me soon. So take care of each other, hug the people you love. See you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.